California is known throughout the world as the home of the car. Images of freeways clogged with vehicles all belching fumes has contributed to its image as a major polluter. Petrol engines emit several harmful greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and nitrogen oxides. Despite California's reputation, it's actually at the forefront of developing cars that don't emit any pollution at all, so-called zero-emission cars. Uh, in 1990, uh, California introduced uh, a law called the Zero Emissions Vehicle Mandate, which actually required auto manufacturers to produce vehicles that have zero tailpipe emissions. The reason for this was they wanted to eliminate greenhouse gases and clean up air quality within the state of California. As a result of the legislation, car manufacturers in California have joined together to try and develop non-polluting engines. Perhaps the most promising development is a car which runs entirely on hydrogen. Hydrogen is a gas. It's very common on Earth, but is usually found in combination with other elements. The advantage of a hydrogen engine is that the only thing it emits is, believe it or not, water. Okay, we're going to head out into our shop. The first thing you'll notice, I guess the very first thing you'll notice is that the air smells clean in here. And why is that? Because we don't have any gasoline or oil or grease products working with hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. So you notice the floor looks very clean. Um, the fuel source is gaseous hydrogen. If you look at this, this is where you actually fuel um, the hydrogen and it looks very different from you know conventional gasoline uh, fixture. It's because hydrogen is being put, put into the tank under high pressure, much like a scuba diving tank is being filled with gaseous uh, oxygen. This is not the first time that hydrogen has been used as a fuel source. Back in the 1930s, it was used to fuel airships. But the catastrophic explosion of the Hindenburg in 1937 made people think hydrogen was terribly dangerous, and it was completely abandoned as a fuel source. So reassuring the public that hydrogen is actually safe is obviously going to be a major concern. If we take a look at the, the tank itself, which is located in the trunk, this particular tank holds four kilograms of hydrogen gas. The weight is 350 pounds. It's kind of interesting. It has an uh, inch and a half aluminum core with three and a half inches of carbon fiber wrap. The tanks are extremely strong. They're certified for use in, in automobiles. They're very similar to what has been around for many years for compressed natural gas. But in the safety testing, they've, they've um, tested these all different sorts of ways, including uh, a drop test where they've um, dropped the, the vehicle on the rear end from over 100 feet high using a crane uh, onto concrete. Uh, the tank you know, wasn't penetrated. Um, they've bonfire tested these. Um, They've even uh, bullet tested them with uh, shooting them with, uh, with a traditional bullet, which couldn't penetrate. They had to use armored piercing bullets just to be able to uh, penetrate the tank. Uh, they actually are safer than um, conventional gasoline tanks if there is a, a collision associated with a vehicle. Hydrogen is, is flammable, but there's so many safeguards um, built into this vehicle, it's incredible. This has a, a safety mechanism built in where the hydrogen has the ability to expel itself so it won't actually ignite and explode. And that's rather fascinating. It's, it's a little trap door that's built into the trunk lid. So this is a, a pressure relief device. If the vehicle experienced excessive, I mean really high temperatures, uh, it has the ability to vent through the trunk lid all the hydrogen gas um, in a safe, safe and controlled manner. So it's not like gasoline that spills all over the floor and it ignites, okay? So that's, that's a, a very unique safety feature. T for this, this size tank, four kilograms, in less than three minutes, the, the tank is fully uh, expelled and there's no you know, pollutants as associated with hydrogen. Under the front seat is a box containing fuel cells in which the hydrogen is combined with oxygen. In the process, electricity is generated, which drives the car. And because hydrogen and oxygen together produce water, that's the only waste product emitted.
The tailpipe emissions are, are drips of, of clean water. If you, if you want to, you put your hand over the tailpipe. If you smell your hand, there is no smell at all. The, the equivalent is, is like distilled water. And actually, before you guys arrived, put a little beaker underneath. But if you take a look at this, it's, it's, it's just clean water. That is the tailpipe emissions. This car holds four kilograms of hydrogen gas in that tank we showed you. Um, the, that would get a driving range of about 160 to 200 miles, depending upon your terrain. Um, has a top speed of about 85 miles an hour. Hydrogen cars in California have developed to the point where the state's first sustainable hydrogen filling station has recently been opened. Well, we're at a hydrogen refueling station. Uh, we built this in the design to be 100% renewable. So we're using the solar powers for the sun's energy to produce electricity and water to make hydrogen. The hydrogen then powers the vehicle and we use hydrogen and oxygen in the vehicle to produce water and electricity. So it has a very cyclical nature, which is something we're after. Uh, obviously trying to create sustainable energy for the future and also uh, environmental protection is one of the main ideas of this project and this type of technology. We have the strictest air quality requirements worldwide. And so the idea is to really start here in California with some great standards and come forth to show the world that we can do it and that the industry can support it to be economically viable as well as protect our environment for the future. So the future for hydrogen cars looks bright, but how viable is this technology? It is a huge task put on the shoulders of the auto manufacturers to produce uh, these vehicles um, and get a certain number out on the road. Uh, our initial vehicles, the introduction, the vehicles were a million dollars each. Now with time and economies of scale, mass production, these vehicle costs will come down. But for all the major auto manufacturers at this time, uh, we're, we're incurring significant outlays of, of revenues um, where we won't see any return on, on those investments for you know, 10 or 15 years out. You know, developing the infrastructure, uh, if you started with uh, fueling stations, there are not enough vehicles to support these fueling stations where the gas and oil companies could make you know, some type of profit or even break even. So all the infrastructure that's going in, into place throughout California is losing money and probably will continue to lose money over the next 10 to 15 years. And this is the challenge that um, you know, all the uh, companies involved with developing hydrogen technologies are facing at this time. California has been at the forefront of encouraging alternative energy sources since the 1970s. Wind power is a sustainable technology they've really encouraged. This is a wind farm in Northern California, one of the largest with nearly 500 wind turbines. The wind turbines themselves essentially harvest the wind energy. Uh, it's converted into a rotational speed that uh, goes through a gearbox into a generator that creates conventional electricity. One of the things you'll notice about wind projects is they tend to locate the towers on top of ridges because that's where you get the most wind. You also have to space them uh, far enough apart that they're not interfering with the energy that each, each one is producing. Um, there are also some size limitations. Uh, just to get these here, you have to travel across roadways, uh, that are used by common buses, cars, and vehicles. And uh, there are certain limits as how how big device you can carry on those roads and get them to these sites for construction. The turbines uh, from the ground to the tip are 415 feet. Uh, that's about 100 feet taller than the Statue of Liberty to give you some idea of the scale, which make them the biggest turbines in North America. The construction of the turbines is a pretty elaborate process.
The crane used to assemble the wind turbines is itself so massive it arrives on 19 separate trucks and has to be assembled on site. The unit housing the generator, electronics and gears is called an cell and is as big as a school bus. These turbines have a 45 meter blade length, 90 meter total blade diameter. Uh, the swept area of that blade is one and a half acres and that's a lot of energy that you can capture with one turbine. Each of these turbines has its own weather station on board. Uh, you'll notice that on top of the nacelle. Uh, they use that information to control uh, the pitch of the blades so they aim themselves into the wind and maximize the amount of energy capture. These turbines are designed to run all the time. When the wind speed comes up, they turn on all by themselves. If the wind gets too strong uh, and they can't handle the load, they'll shut themselves off. Uh, but they run 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. As the technology has evolved, they've been able to operate over much greater wind speeds. Uh, the units behind me, they'll start uh, generating electricity when wind speeds are about 8 miles an hour, and they'll continue up to about 55 miles an hour before they shut themselves off. So that's a very broad range where they're actually capturing energy from the wind. These huge wind turbines are so effective that each one can power a thousand homes a year. Uh, one of the disadvantages is that the wind tends to blow in places where people don't live. So one of the challenges is how do you get the electricity from these sites to where the population centers are. One of the unique challenges of wind energy is that it's intermittent in nature. Sometimes the wind just doesn't blow. Uh, what we'd like to be able to do is store the energy and be able to use it when people need it. Unfortunately, the storage technologies are behind the actual turbines themselves. Not everyone is in favor of wind turbines, however. Many people think they're ugly and a blight on the landscape. But John Bertolino doesn't agree. The advantages of wind is that it does not disrupt land use very much. You know, you still see there's the same cows that used to graze here before we built the turbines are still enjoying the local grass. Wind energy is one of the cleanest sources, if not the cleanest source of energy out there. There's no hazardous materials to keep them running. They don't need any feedstock, any fuels um, that create hazards. And there's no emissions. So there's really no impact to the environment other than what you see.